the complete what feels like eroding of the discipline of bioethics to yeah. begin with. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's even operative in American life anymore. And yeah. and and it didn't have to be that way. You know, during the Bush administration, this was one of the few things that the Bush administration did well. There was a, a National Council of Bioethics, you know, recognizing that at the turn of the millennium, there are going to be extremely novel new technologies that are going to come out of progress uh, progress in genetics and in other fields. And, and we should be sure to reconcile these developments to human flourishing. Uh, it's not clear that that happens anymore. What is your macro assessment of the field of bioethics and and really ethics and science more broadly? And then we can dive into some yeah. of the more horrific examples. So unfortunately, there are some notable exceptions, but unfortunately, the general trend in professional bioethics and academic bioethics today is basically to serve as a, a rubber stamp to kind of wring your hands for a little while and scratch your head for a little while, but at the end of the day to green light more or less whatever uh, the scientific and medical establishment wants to do. And much of that is driven by money, by financial considerations. And so the field of professional bioethics has not shown itself to be one that it, uh, that that is occupied by people willing to adhere to even the most basic and fundamental principles. So my opposition to COVID vaccine mandates, my legal case against them, rested for me on the ethical principle of informed consent, which goes all the way back to the Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code is a document that everyone should read. It's not long or complicated. It's like one or two pages long. There's 10 principles articulated in the code. This was developed in the wake of the horrors of Nazi medicine after World War II and the Nuremberg trials where a dozen Nazi physicians were tried for crimes against humanity. More than half of them were convicted and some of them actually received the death penalty. They hanged for violating the first principle of the Nuremberg Code, which is the principle of informed consent, that adults of sound mind have the right to accept or decline to participate in research and that was later extend, extended to accept it or decline a medical intervention after giving adequate information about it. So Americans were not given adequate information. So we didn't have the informed part, a strict control on the flow of information dictated mostly by pharmaceutical company interests, uh, uh, basically dictated what Americans knew and didn't know about the vaccines and about the clinical trials and so forth. So there was no transparency. We had to fight to get transparency on that. Uh, and there was no consent if it was mandated anyway. So people had bad information. And even if they, you know, in the face of that, they went and did their own research and got better information and decided, you know, in my case, I don't want this. In, in many cases, because they worked for a certain company or they worked for a government entity, they were forced to take it against their will, which is the very same mistake that the Germans made back in the 1930s and the 1940s that ended up leading to the grossest abuses in medical research and medical practice. So that that's a big problem. There was the transparency issue. I had to coordinate a group of a couple of dozen physicians and scientists to force the federal government to do what it was required to do under federal law in terms of transparency about the Pfizer vaccine clinical trials. So the day that the FDA authorized the Pfizer vaccine, federal law required that all of the clinical trial data, not just the one published paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, but the hundreds of thousands of pages of data from the clinical trial be made publicly available so that it, independent researchers could take a look at it and so that Americans could be informed about exactly what was done and what the clinical trials showed, not just the curated information that uh, the authors of that paper, all of whom had connections, financial connections to big pharma, uh, were, were saying about the clinical trials. So we had to file a suit in federal court, uh, well, a FOIA request in federal court to get the Pfizer clinical trials data the federal government, the, F, the DOJ lawyers representing the FDA came back and said, they knew they couldn't say no, but they tried to slow walk it. They said, we'll give you 500 pages a month, which if you do the math, would have taken 75 years to release data <laughs> that they reviewed in only 108 days. We had a good federal, federal judge in that case who said, no, you have nine months to release the data. So we need to see it. 
the next thing that happened is that Pfizer intervened, not surprisingly, saying we want to redact the data before it's released. Again, not surprising, that would maybe serve their own interest. But what was surprising and sort of shocking was that the DOJ lawyers representing the FDA agreed with Pfizer and petitioned the court to allow Pfizer to redact what the data. What kind of data would they claim they have a right to redact? So they, they wanted to say, you know, there could be proprietary data in there that, you know, company secrets uh, type type of stuff. But that that was implausible on the face of it because they had already had to redact those things from the data before they released it to the FDA and other regulatory agencies. So that that job was already done. And the data as it was, as it had been released to the regulatory agencies should have also been released to the American people. So fortunately, our, again, good judge in this case said, no, Pfizer is not gonna be allowed to redact, redact the data. And we got a good outcome in that case, but it shouldn't take the private and expensive action of citizens to force the federal government to do what federal law clearly says the government is required to do in these circumstances. And again, looking at the public health establishment, very few people were demanding this kind of transparency from our public health agencies. Most, most of them just fell in line and became shills and mouthpieces for the government's preferred pandemic policies, vilifying, slandering, silencing anyone uh, whether myself, Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Koldorf, Scott Atlas, these new friends of mine in this <laughs> fight, uh, who were criticizing the government's policies, proposing uh, alternative solutions. I hesitate to even call them alternative because they were really just traditional public health approaches to something like this. Uh, they were vilified. In some cases, they were forced out of institutions like, like I was. Um, and the, um, the both the public health establishment and the bioethics establishment stood on the sidelines and more or less acted as cheerleaders for the for the regime in power. I'm curious to know, you know, as we start to move to some of these um, other topics that the biomedical establishment has uh, some authority over, like um, you know, transgenderism, assisted suicide, that sort of thing. What is the you know, political persuasion of most people in the in the bioethics yep. field. Um, I I'm gonna take it an an informed guess and say that they, they probably don't come from the same perspective that you do. But I'd be curious to hear more about that. Yeah. So as with most things in academia, academic bioethicists are gonna tilt strongly left. Um, you know, and you're you're gonna have certainly you're gonna have liber libertarians who maybe. Um, on other political issues wouldn't be considered left-leaning, but are very sort of libertarian, permissive, hands-off when it comes to bioethics issues, you know, procreative liberty and just let people do what they wanna do. If the market allows it, the technology allows it, it should be permitted. Um, and then you have, a, you have a lot of progressives who are trying to advance particular social agendas through the mechanisms of bioethics and science and technology and so forth. Um, there are conservative voices in bioethics, certainly. Um, there are many Christian voices in bioethics, certainly, but they don't currently establish, uh, you know, they don't currently occupy sort of established uh, places of authority within bioethics generally. So Bush's Council on Bioethics, chaired by Leon Cass, and then following that, chaired by my mentor at Georgetown, Edmund Pellegrino, that Council was an exception to the rule and gathered together. Actually, it was a very diverse council. People characterize it as just a bunch of neocons, but it, it wasn't. It was it had people from across the uh, political and ideological spectrum. But what was unique about it is that it included on that spectrum some prominent conservative voices, and um, you know many of my friends and, and mentors were deeply involved in the President's Council as members. My friend Carter Sneed was their general counsel. Um, yeah, I teach with Bill Hurlbutt and Gil Mylander, who were both members of the council for years. Robbie George, who was a prominent member of the council, is also a friend. So those guys have gone out and helped to cultivate a new, younger generation of bioethicists who are informed uh, by principles other than um, liberal progressivism or other than a kind of strict libertarian approach to these things. But um, there are very few institutional homes 
for those folks now. There are some think tanks that have you know taken us in and supported our work, uh, and some smaller institutions where you can find those folks. But right now, you know, we we have to operate as a sort of creative minority in the professionalized bioethics space in order to get a hearing in order to be part of the conversation.